Welcome to AI Exposed. I'm your host, Justin Scott. This is a podcast dedicated to exploring all the technologies that premier support for developer teams at Microsoft use when helping companies just like yours looking to take advantage of artificial intelligence. In this episode, we talk with Beth Saransky. She's an Azure Cloud Analytics architect here at Microsoft. Beth and I sit down to talk to what the beginner getting started in machine learning can do, some of the tools they can use, and some of the challenge that they'll have. Hope you enjoy the show. Well, hi, Beth. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Justin. Uh, it's great to be here. Yeah. Well, you and I have had a few conversations along the last couple of weeks, and one of the things that stood out most to me was that you were really big on making uh, it known how easy it is to get started with machine learning. And I really thought that would resonate well with our audience. So today we talked about going step by step through a normal process that kind of could get people started. Uh, so start, start us off before we even get into that. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay, I, I have a pretty wide breadth of experience in my background. I started out as a hardware designer doing custom, semi-custom, gate array and standard cells, which leads you to a very interesting way of thinking about problems and learning to, to step through them. And from there, I became a BIOS developer, and then I went into software development. And part of my experience, I worked for Red Hat Software on Red Hat Enterprise Linux so that I have a great deal of experience in Linux. I also have experience doing R and R Studio. And after that, I worked for VMware, which is where I did quite a bit of work on VRA, part of the VRA team, and learned a great deal about cloud and virtualization. So that when I came to Microsoft, my knowledge of those areas really helped me understand machine learning on Azure and how to implement that with partners so that they could be successful too. Wow. Yeah, you just don't hear people that have the deep hardware, deep software, and now on the data side. So that's that's a great diverse background for some of these problems I bet that you're involved with. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But what I would love to do, though, is if we could dive in and, and start understanding, I mean, where does someone get started with all this crazy talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence and all that? Okay, well, let me tell you a little bit more too because I work directly with partners to help them understand where they can use machine learning and analytics and their implementations as well as they're typically shocked when they learn how easy it is to actually do a proof of concept with Azure Machine Learning and our other machine learning capabilities and how simple it is to go to production with it. So what I typically explain is that first, the most important part of doing any machine learning experiment is to acquire and understand your data. In fact, I've spent more time working with data and cleaning dirty data than I have developing machine learning models. Mm. So the first thing I would say to anyone who wants to do machine learning is, if you're just learning, take an existing data set, understand it a bit, understand what are the parts that you think might be important to you, and then that's the very first step that you would need to understand what to do next. And as an insider hint, I would typically say that people grossly underestimate in a real project how much time and effort it takes to clean up the data so it's usable. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, when you're working with uh, your customers and you're kind mm -hmm. of starting to go down the path of helping them understand how important it is to have clean data, what mm -hmm. are some of the tools that you even go down the path of using to start this process of investigating your data, understanding it, and, and knowing where to go next. Okay, so as a data scientist, a lot of people end up using R or Python. I happen to be an R person. But what I've found for a lot of people who are not, it is just as effective and efficient to use Excel for, as one of the items because there's a great deal of manipulation you can do in Excel, and people understand Excel really well. It's very visual, they can go in and write their own scripts. That's one way. Because I'm also a Linux person, my personal favorite is a tool called Awk. It's a command line tool that enables you to do an amazing amount of data cleaning with very little effort. 
Hmm. So what this means is that you have quite a range from Excel, a ton of people know on Windows. Awk, most people who are familiar with Linux are also familiar with Awk. So there are a number of solutions that you can use to actually clean data. Okay. And do you do some investigative type uh, analysis before even touching the data just to know how bad things are? Or are there domain uh, specific items that uh, we know we got to do these 15 things before we even get started? I mean, what's the process? Hmm. So the process usually when you first get your data and you do some cleaning, and even before you do cleaning, generally you do some quick graphing. And you can do this in Excel, you can do it in Azure ML, you can do it in R, you can do it in Python very easily where you say, take this one column of data and just draw a graph and see what it looks like just so you get a feel. And that a lot of times will give you a lot of insight if there's something wrong with your data. In fact, one area that I had been working, when I first did a graph, we were doing something across multiple days of the week and we had 10,000 data points and when I looked, they were all on Wednesday. And I said, well, I think we have a problem here because if you're trying to analyze activity across an entire week and you only have Wednesday as your data point, that's not going to work very well for understanding what's going on the rest of the week. Mm, I see. Now, if you have large sets of data, uh, maybe too big for a local drive or something like that, what are some of the starting points? I mean, do you sample the data and kind of sift through it and get an idea? Do you try to get it to a much bigger repository so you can look at it all once, or, or is it a case-by-case -case situation? Well, with that, it depends what you're trying to do. If you have something where you're just trying to get a sense of the data, and it's a data set that many other people have already used and they've already done some cleaning, then that's different than if you're generating your own data that could be totally dirty. Mm -hmm. So if you have a data set that's perfectly clean, you may look at it and say, okay, if I'm going to analyze, I'll just take a look at a few parts. But I generally recommend looking at the entire set because then you can tell what, where your edge cases are. You can tell where your mins and maxes are. You can tell if something's skewed. If you take a sub piece, you really can't do that. But if you're just learning machine learning and you're taking a data set just to try out the learning, you don't need to do that. Okay. You can either do it local. We also have Microsoft R server has some really nice capabilities for using R and some other capabilities for looking at, at graphs of data pretty easily. And if you happen to be using Azure machine learning, all you have to do is open up the data set and click and it will do a very tiny graph of each column of data and it will provide mins, max, and some other interesting stats on the data. So you get a pretty quick insight as to what you're working with. But for people who have not done this before, my recommendation is to take a well-known data set, do a little bit of cleaning so you understand what that's about, and then move on to playing with models so that you can learn about the interesting pieces of machine learning as well. Okay, so you threw a couple of terms out there that just want to catch maybe someone who's mm -hmm. just seeing some of this or hearing this for the first time. Um, you know, R server, uh, Azure mm -hmm. ML. I mean, do you need all of these things, or can you can you keep it simple at first? What's your thoughts? Well, the simplest thing I think to do is Azure Machine Learning made a really good choice in that they have what's called an eight-hour account without even creating a login. You can go to Azure ML and import data, do some machine learning, and try it out without even creating an account. It is so easy. It makes it a really nice way to introduce people to try it. Ah, OK. Uh, so they also have, if you want to save the work you've done for more than, than eight hours, you can also create a free account and do some base work as well. And I found those are really easy ways to ramp up. And that way, you don't have to pollute your laptop by installing additional apps. You can just go to the cloud, try Azure ML, and it's very simple. Ah, well, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you happen to know the URL for that? Or is that something that I should put in the uh, end of the notes here? Uh, we can put that in the notes. Uh, it is on the main page. And also, I have a tutorial in GitHub that explains a very simple process for doing machine learning and it has a reference in the first page for how to get to the free site. Okay, we'll put a reference to that in the notes then. Okay. So that's great. So we are talking about gathering the data and we're talking about uh, kind of grooming through it. How do you mm -hmm. know when enough is enough? I mean, if you think about something with thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of rows uh, and coming from many sources 
you know, sometimes I think of things like hospital records or, or anything mm -hmm. like that. You're just not going to get it to perfection. How do you know when enough is enough? Well, to a certain extent, part of that is an intuition from having worked with the data. But there are some real basics that are accepted so that if you have rows or columns that are missing data or pieces of data, there are known things that you can do. And for newbies, I wouldn't recommend fretting about that too much. That would be something that you would understand more when you get deeper into it. And so I would suggest for your first projects, if you're just looking to use machine learning, even if you have really dirty data, it's very likely you'll get a pretty good outcome. And one of the workshops that I teach, we actually use dirty data to make flight predictions. And it still works pretty well, even though some of the data is dirty. Hmm. Okay. So as somebody starting off, what kind of questions could they ask that is relevant to their company that makes sense to get started with? Okay. What I typically recommend is to start off simply with something that you can think about easily. For example, is my flight going to be late? Take some flight data. Everyone kind of has uh, a sense of what are the things that might make a flight late? It could be which month of the year are you flying? What day of the week of you, are you flying? Which airline or which airport are you flying out of? Those are things that people would generally be able to say, yes, I think those might be the columns that would be significant in my data set. And so starting with questions that are yes, no, or similar to that are the easiest way to begin in terms of there are well-known algorithms that you can pick from so that you don't need to know math, you don't need to know an algorithm. And once you understand how to do something simple like that, it's also very simple to then take the next step and say, let's go to a more complicated answer. Say I'm looking for a number or a percentage of business growth or a percent of return customers. That would be a nice next step. Or there's something called a multi-class classification where you would say, take a look at my image image? Is it a cat or a dog kind of thing? Hmm. And okay. so I would recommend going in incremental steps to learn how to do that. Okay. So let's dive into the first one, the first step that you just mentioned, uh, the, the yes, no concept. What I think mm -hmm. I hear is you have a couple columns uh, mm -hmm. and, and let's, let's dive into the flight one, for example. You, mm -hmm. you have things like month, uh, maybe days of the week. It, it could even get to what hour it takes off. Uh, all Correct. kinds of uh, could even get into who the pilot is. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> all those ca <laughs> all those categories. Um, and what I think I hear is by having all that set in columns of data on a row by row basis of say something like flight number, you'll be able to say yes, there's high odds that'll be uh, late, or no, that won't. It, it makes a definitive answer for you. Is it, am I hearing that right? You're you're hearing that right, but it's a little different. The flight wouldn't be the rows. The flight would be yet another column in the data. Uh, and yeah, in yeah, fact, yeah. the nice part is you don't actually have to decide which columns are necessarily the most important. You can make a general selection, run them through a model, and then you can go back and iterate and say, well, let me add this one in, take this one out. You can also evaluate how significant it is towards the outcome. Okay. So that you don't have to be that exact. Okay. Now, I know when you're using Azure ML, it actually has a few kind of walkthroughs for the beginner. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but taking you through this process for this example, what I, what I hear is you would get something Excel-like, tablature in nature, and you would actually show the um, – how would you say this? You would, you would actually uh, run a model, but how would the beginner know what model to even choose for this? Okay. Well – there are several different types of models that you can choose from. What I had mentioned so far was a yes, no. That's called a two class because it's a yes or a no. So there's two classes classification. Um, that would be where I would recommend something like a flight determination to begin with. And what Microsoft has done is come up with a really nice cheat sheet that I can provide to you in the notes so that people can use it. And what it does is give you okay, here are the main types of machine learning algorithms that you might choose from. Here are the particular algorithms within each type. And it gives a few words about why you might want to pick one over the other. Ah, okay. That'd be great. 
And what I usually recommend is for brand new people who haven't done this, if you know that you're going for a yes, no answer, you know that it's two class. So then you take some of the algorithms that are within two class and just run, run many of them, run three or four of them, and then let the machine learning model compare the outputs to see which one performs best. Okay. And what are some techniques to know which one performed best? Okay. So there's actually some capabilities in machine learning where you can use algorithms to evaluate your model with your data and it will come up with numeric responses to tell you which ones work better and which ones worked worse. And those are something that we can get into more detail another time. But generally for your first model when you're just learning, just stepping through and picking some of the first algorithms and trying them is the best way to go. Okay. And to expand on that a little bit, it's you have data that says all the factors and says whether it was late or not, right? So the model Correct. is sort of tested upon that same data that you had to decide if it's valid or not or, or how strong the prediction is. Is that what you're saying? So generally what you would do is take a data set and you would split it, 80, say, 80-20. 80% is what you're going to use to train your model, and that will train your algorithm, and you can take that output and then you take that and compare it against the test data that's left, the 20%. And then because it learned on the training set, you then compare it to a test data set to see how your model actually ran. Right, right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then, so you've gone through this process, you've played around with models. Is there some gotchas or anything to think about while you're going through this process? Well, when you're just learning, I would say the most important thing is to try things. You can't break anything. Mm -hmm. And then there are blocks in Azure ML, there are blocks in R, whereby you can test your outputs and graph to see how well it actually worked. And some of that learning will take a little bit more to do, but for a beginner, going for yes, no is a pretty straightforward approach. Uh, the one thing I would say people need to be aware of is that if you decide you want to operationalize your model, say there's one thing between running it once with some inputs and another is, say you want to put it out on the web and access it as an API. That is very simple to do today. So that if you do make a model, for example, say you do make a model to tell if your flight's going to be late. You can push it out on the web with an API and just call it from any application. Excel has a really nice interface for providing data input into your model. Say you want to test, I know I'm going to be flying on this day with this airline and these other attributes, pass in the data, it will run out on the cloud, it will respond with your result and tell you your flight determination, whether it's late or not. And it's very simple to do that. And what are some methods for calling that operationalized piece? Uh, like it's just an API, so it's very just like you would call any other API. And in fact, if you do it through Excel, all you need to do is take an API key and a universal resource indicator from the web uh, app that you pushed out for that ML, drop them into Excel, and it just works. You don't need to write any code. Uh, I bet you people will love that. So we talked about getting the data. We've talked about turning it into a, a model and playing around with that. Uh, and now we've uh, talked a little bit about operationalizing that. How do you mature that? How do you make it where, you know, one thing I hear a lot is we made this great model, but the world has changed a little bit since then. How do we sort of keep maturing that model while it's being operational? Well, so you can iterate. You can take and save all of the data that you've gotten as well as the responses and you can retrain your model. And in fact, one of the things I had mentioned was that when you run your test data, you can score your model to see how well it worked and evaluate it. Well, over time, as you collect more data, you can retrain your model, update your, update your model out on the web, and that way you have updated results and you can aggregate more insight based on additional data that you've acquired. Hmm. And are there methods to collect data and automatically start tuning that piece without human intervention? 
there are some things that can be done for that, but I tend to think that would be outside the realm of what a beginner would be trying to do. Absolutely, it, yes. That does take a little bit more to do. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so we've gone through a full life cycle. What are some other things that maybe somebody wouldn't really think of that are, are part of this? Some, you know, As they're trying to sell this internally at their company, just to make sure they've covered all their bases, are there any good lessons learned that you've had recently? What, one of the biggest thing I've found with beginners is that there's a belief that this is really hard and that they need to know a lot of algebra and a lot of math just to begin. And the fact is that, that that's not true. For, for everyday people or for developers, both are in a very good position to learn how to create and run algorithms in machine learning. Yeah. So that's, that's, yeah, I, I would say the biggest thing is to get over the fear and just try it. Right. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Now, we we do know of companies that are pushing the boundaries with things, and you need some deep domain knowledge, and you can get in trouble with making huge business decisions from just a simple model without experimenting. That's, that's where the data scientist really shines, right? But I think what you're saying is there's a lot somebody can do with some basic skills as well. Right. So if you're talking about predicting cancer or doing things like that, it does take a little bit more insight and a little bit more work. But for a lot of the common things that people would find valuable today, you don't need to have that extent of data science knowledge. Mm. And that's one of the things I think that many people don't realize is how much they're capable of doing without knowing some of the details of machine learning. Mm -hmm. So for the person getting started, I mean, sure, we've thrown a lot of terms at them. We've kind of walked them through a, a life cycle. Where else do you recommend? Are there any other sources of information that you recommend they read up on? Yes. Yeah, so there are a number of areas available today. In fact, Microsoft has a data science professional program that starts from the very basics and shows how using Excel and others, how you can start there you can learn a little bit of R, a little bit of Python, some of the other basics if you have that interest. And you can get pretty far along in terms of understanding what it is you need to know. Mm. And they do have some courses that if you are interested, you can dig deeper into statistics. But one of the things I've found is that if you are going off and doing work on data science, it's not just the data science algorithms. You need people who have expertise with understanding the business space because you may have the data, but if you don't understand the implication of how the business works, that's a challenge. So if you can get someone who has the business knowledge to contribute, that's a huge win. And they typically are a little reluctant to get involved because they think machine learning is out of their space. Mm -hmm. But once they get involved, they realize how much they actually have to contribute to. So there's the business knowledge. I can't say enough about how much work is required to actually work with data. And then the separate piece of developing models, typically use the models that are already, many people use the models that are already provided. Whereas data scientists can create their own models for specialties, the common person does not need to do that. Right. So there are many different areas and many different roles that require different expertise. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for people who aren't even considering that as an option today. Hmm. Okay. And I know we have a wealth of libraries and, and models and, and things to help with massaging data in our in our own machine uh, learn Azure machine learning uh, product. What are some sources for that? I mean, does the typical person have everything they need there, or is there other resources to go to? Well, for starting with the basics, that's fine. I mean, there's Azure Machine Learning is just one piece. There's also so Microsoft R Server has uh, some pieces in that as well. So depending on where your company currently keeps their data, there's a lot of different places where you can go and do your work with this. But if you go out and search, there are a ton of tutorials. Microsoft has a gallery filled with machine learning examples. And the best part is you can go and just try them. In fact, one of my other favorite examples is an example that shows who is the most likely to survive on the Titanic. And they provide a data set of all the passengers, step you through every step of how you want to think about that, how you implement a model for that, and then how you run it and get your outputs and 
evaluate those outputs. Yeah. And so that's all available for new people. Yes. And it's funny you say that. I actually uh, have worked on that Titanic problem. And it's a, it's a really fun example to uh, kind of hit points at home and surprises you with some of the things that are related, which is pr exactly why data science is, uh, is where it is. <laughs> so, uh, right. well, well, Beth, uh, tell us a little bit, you know, what are you interested in doing in the next few years? What's, what do you see on the horizon technology wise that really interests you? So there are a number of related areas for machine learning. People have heard a little bit about AI and deep neural nets, and those are basically another layer on top of machine learning that provide different insights. So those are getting much more into visual capabilities, audio capabilities. I think up till now, a lot of the text things that we've done are limited in terms of what they what problems they've thought that we could address. Well, Right now, I think that there's an opportunity. There is a, a huge amount of data out there, both for our, from our governments and from health providers and that area, that I think as individuals become more capable with machine learning, that they can go and generate insights and that we can actually make changes in our society and in our world. Because when you shine a spotlight on something and you have the data, that's what's going to cause true change. So I think this is a huge opportunity for all of us. Absolutely. Uh, well, Beth, we sure appreciate your time. I look forward to having you on the show for probably four or five other topics that you have brought up in, the, <laughs> in other conversations. <laughs> so you're a wealth of information, and we very much appreciate your time, and thank you for uh, being on our show. Oh, Justin, thank you for having me. I enjoy sharing the information on this as an opportunity so that people can go and learn about machine learning themselves. Absolutely. Uh, thank you again. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thanks for joining us on AI Exposed. Once again, I'm your host, Justin Scott, and I'd love your feedback on this show. Just hit me up on Twitter at AI Exposed or send me an email at AI Exposed at Outlook.com. Take care.